we have several in the back who can help us with that too. All right. Um, we're in Matthew chapter 5, and we're looking at verse 4 tonight. Just a, just a quick reminder. These are the Beatitudes. Uh, they all start with the word blessed. And we looked at the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Last time we noticed that um, poor in spirit does not mean that you're, that you're walking around with your head, your chin dragging on the ground. It doesn't mean that. It means that you have a proper understanding of who you are in light of who God is. And um, so you don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. And we also notice that verse 3 and verse 10 end the same way, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it's in the present tense. And we, uh, we, we talked about that some last time. We're going to look at the next verse now, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So the spiritual attitude starts the same way all the way through these 10 verses. And we'll, we'll just kind of remind you each one. It starts with the word blessed. It starts with the word blessed. It starts with Jesus repeated that. And I, and I think it's important for us to remind ourselves that when, when the Spirit of God or when the Lord Jesus repeats something, it's not just... Um, it's it's not it's not just something that it, that is glossed over and like we kind of don't know why he's doing that. It's it's for effect. It is to remind us that this is an important thing to remember. We are blessed. 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 It's over and over and over and over again through the course of this. The thought related to being blessed is the same as we saw last week. It's worth a quick review. These are the people, plural, who are happy or fortunate. And I like that concept of favored by God better than happy and fortunate. Happy and fortunate sort of suggest the idea that I stumbled across a $100 bill. Some of you aren't aware of this, but over the course of the last several weeks, I've been kind of in my backyard working. And, oh, there's a $100 bill. There's another one. There's another one. I picked them up and they all say, for use in the film industry, and there's this copy on the bottom, and they look real. So a few weeks ago, I, I just brought one and just handed it to Josh. He goes, oh, thank you. And I said, you'll notice, oh, <laughs> I thought it was real too. So um, it's not that you stumble around in your background and find a $100 bill, right? Or you, you wake up one morning, you have a letter in the mail, and it says, your aunt, you know, Bertha, who you've never met, died and left you $100,000. That's, that's that's, this is not that. This is, I am favored by God because. That's why I like that second definition. So the focus is on those who are already in a relationship with God. This is not how you become a Christian. This is, for those of you who are in a relationship with the living God, you are blessed because of. And then it says in verse 4, blessed are those who mourn. That seems oxymoronic, doesn't it? Happy are those who are sad. Fortunate are those who are devastated. I mean, it just seems like, what are you talking about? Blessed are those who mourn. Doesn't seem to make sense. Leon Morris wrote, We generally regard mourners as the most unfortunate of people. If these are people who are fortunate or favored by God, we typically view mourners as those who are unfortunate, not favored by God. Quote goes on, We see them as people to be pitied, to be helped, to be comforted, but not as those to be envied as recipients of God's blessing. That's how we typically view someone who is mourning. We normally attach the word mourn with the idea of loss. So when, when you think of somebody who is a mourner, what's the first thing you think of? Somebody who has lost a... Absolutely. It's the first thing that comes to our mind. I've lost a loved one. I'm in mourning. We even say it that way. I'm in mourning. Or that person is in mourning because they've lost a loved one. You can mourn other things. You can mourn the loss of 
you know, a job. You can mourn the fact that it wasn't a hundred dollar bill, it was fake. You can mourn a lot of different things, right? You can mourn things that are a loss. But typically that's how we view the concept of mourning. I've lost something. Something has gone on that has hit me hard. Viewing that kind of loss as a valid reason to feel blessed is hard for us to fathom. Some form of loss diminishes our lives and we're supposed to be blessed by that. Now, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we can be blessed of God during times of mourning. So, during times of mourning like we've just described. We can be blessed of God in those situations. Um, we have, if, you, if you've been around for more than a few days, more than a few years, you've probably experienced mourning. You've lost a parent. You've lost a child. You've lost a spouse. You've lost a loved one in some respect. And you are, you've gone through mourning. We can be blessed in those situations. But this is not the kind of mourning that we're talking about. We have a hard time considering it a blessing to feel comforted, which is the compatible blessing that goes with this, way off in the future. So that's an, uh, we'll come back to what the mourning really is, but this is another part that we would have a hard time th- feeling blessed about. I feel blessed because I'm going to be blessed five years from now, ten years from now. 25 years from now, off into the future. I'm going to be blessed during the kingdom. If we have the pain of a loss that we've experienced in the present or the recent past, the idea of a blessing way off in the future is hard for us to... Think of this from the perspective of somebody who has lost a loved one. You come up to them and your words of comfort are, 10 years from now, this won't feel so bad. Really? That's your comfort? It may be true. We won't be mourning in the same way. But for those of us who have lost a loved one, someone who is particularly close to us, every now and then that still crops up. Maybe less often. When, When did your mom die? 20, same, same year as my dad died, 2017. So that's been seven years now for both of us. We lost parents. Your, your dad died 1969. Um, you still, those are people that were very important in your life, and you're still going to mourn them. But the idea that, you, that it gets a little better over time, it, it gets different. You don't mourn in the same way. But for someone to say, you're going to be blessed in the future on the basis of the morning you're going through right now, is uh, I'm, I'm not, I, don't want to, I don't want to be sacrilegious, but, but I just want you to get the sense that, that that idea, if this is the morning that's being talked about, that idea just doesn't cut it. It just doesn't cut it. If this is, if this is Jesus' idea of comforting someone who's lost a loved one, somehow he's missed the boat. So understanding this mourning in the context of relational or material loss just isn't what Jesus has in mind. Okay, So Jesus is not talking about the loss of a loved one here. It's better to consider this mourning from a spiritual perspective. So what are we mourning? What is it that Jesus is talking about? That is, this is a mourning not over physical or relational loss or material loss, but a mourning over sin and its devastating consequences, both personal and for all of us. Do you mourn what you see taking place in our country today? Yeah. I mean, to watch an entire generation of children be told that their lives will be happier if they refuse to acknowledge who they were created by God to be. 
That is, that's hurtful. It's hurtful to, for them. It's hurtful for us. It's hurtful for our country, our society. It's hurtful. It ought to cause us to mourn. We're going to do a series of signs during the month of June. The month of June, of course, has been designated as Alphabet Soup Pride Month. We're going to do a series of signs that all start with, we celebrate Jesus. His humility, His love, His sacrifice, His salvation. We'll do a series of signs. That'll be interrupted in the middle by VBS. because We'll have some things from about VBS on the sign. But what we want people to see is that we have something to celebrate that is not physical, it is spiritual, and it is not about being proud of our sin. We celebrate someone. So we're going to do that because what we want our society to see is we have something to celebrate, but what you're talking about is something that's worth mourning. I'm going to read you a few quotes, and one of these is extended, but let me read you a couple of them. David Miller says this in his New Testament commentary, and I'm quoting David Miller because this is a New Testament commentary that was put out by Regular Baptist Press. David Miller is a prophet, Cedarville. He says this, Disciples who view the brokenness of their own lives and of others' lives as God does... I'm sorry, let me read that again. Disciples who view the brokenness of their own lives and of others' lives as God does will find many reasons to mourn, but they also look forward to the future when God will set the world straight and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning. Revelation 21, verse 4. And Tasker says this, he agrees on that and expands with it. Expands with it. They that mourn are those who are sorrowful, both for their own sins and failings, and also for the evil that is rampant in the world and the cause of so much suffering and misery. And then this is the extended quote. This is from Leon Morris in his commentary on Matthew. Perhaps we should bear in quote, perhaps we should bear in mind that typically the world takes a light-hearted attitude to the serious issues of life. A fact that is very evident in our modern pleasure-loving generation. In their seeking after self-gratification and pleasure, they do not grieve over sin or evil. Because they do not grieve over what is wrong in themselves, they do not repent. And because they do not grieve over the wrong they share with others in the communities in which they live, they take few steps to set things right. Because they are not moved by the plight of the poor and the suffering, they make no move to help the world's unfortunates. It may be that Jesus is saying that our values are wrong, and that it is those who mourn in the face of the evils that are part and parcel of life as we know it, those who mourn over the way God's cause is so often neglected and His people despised, who are the truly blessed ones. The psalmist could say, My eyes shed streams of tears because men do not keep thy law. Psalm 119, verse 136. End quote. So the idea of mourning here is mourning over the things that God mourns. Weeping over the things that bring tears to God's eyes. It is mourning over the broken condition of the world in which we live because it is damaged by sin. It is mourning over the horrible consequences of sin, our own and those of the world at large. It is those people who mourn what is wrong, not just what's unfortunate and painful, who mourn over what is wrong, who are eventually blessed. Remember in John 11, that Jesus comes to the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus four days after Lazarus has died. And Martha comes out and meets him, and she said, if you'd have been here, my brother hadn't died. And then she sends to Mary and says, the Master's here and He's calling for you. And um, 
Mary comes out and, and says almost exactly the same words. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus asks, where did they lay him? And then the shortest verse in the Bible. It's on 11.35. Jesus wept. If you go back in your memory banks to when we talked about that, Jesus didn't weep because Lazarus was dead. He waited to be sure Lazarus had died before he came. Jesus knew what he was going to do. He wasn't mourning the death of Lazarus. He was mourning the sinful, wretched, wicked condition of the people who would watch Lazarus come out of that tomb and still not believe. He was mourning the fact that the people that he came to save were about to reject him publicly and he would be crucified. Not that he was saying, I don't want to be crucified. What he was saying was, that's the reason he came. What he was saying, what he was mourning was, if you remember, he we, we wept over Jerusalem, or wept over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft I would have gathered you under my wings as a hen gathers her, chicken, her chicks, and you would not. You would not. That's the kind of mourning we're talking about here. So, favored are those who mourn as God mourns, over the things that God mourns. Now, there's a compatible blessing that shows up here. And you notice that the tense of the verb has changed, and it'll stay in this tense down through verse 9. For they shall be. Verses, unlike verses 3 and 10, the verb is future here, not present. Actually, the verb is they shall, shall be comforted. Future tense, and the verb is to be comforted. We'll talk about the word comforted here in just a second. The world in which you live is not yet free from the de devastating effects of sin and death. We can look around us and watch out what's going on. We can see all those things and, and be in, in mourning now because the world has not yet been set right. We're still in the situation where sin seems to be dominant. Who is the ruler of this world? Yeah, it's not Jesus. It's Satan. So, Sin is still in a dominant mode right now, which is frustrating to us, those of us who know Christ. It's frustrating that, that judges and, and, and juries reach godless verdicts. It's frustrating to us that people in positions of, of um, political and influential power, people who are influencers, are godless people. It's amazing to us when one of them is not, right? I mean, we look at somebody, I, I, I'm a sports fan, so I was watching some of the stuff that was going on with the NFL draft, and I happened to take a look at the kid who was picked first by the Detroit team. And in his, his interview, um, after he had been chosen, he said, let me, let me start off with this. Let me say this first and foremost. I want to thank my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ who has put me in this position. And I'm going, ha, 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 yes! You know? So often it's like, yeah, man, I'm the best! You don't believe me? Ask me. I'll tell you again. And it's just like, oh, really? This kid was humble, and he was giving glory to God. And yeah, he said, God's blessed me and given me some talents. I'm going to do my best to help this team, blah, blah, blah. But... but uh, and that was he started that way, and two or three more times during the interview, he wanted to talk about Christ. That's good, but that's unusual. The world in which we live is a world where people harm one another. It's a world in which wars crop up with alarming frequency. It's a world in which the aggressor turns into the victim just because the aggressor says, I want to be the victim. It's a world where crime is rampant and where leaders choose to ignore it. I mean, we, 
In our country, we are living in a world where the leaders who are supposed to deal with crime are choosing to ignore it and are putting the criminals back on the street at no cost to the criminal to commit crimes again. It's a world in which death is all around us and in which God's will, so perfect and complete in heaven, remember Jesus' model prayer, on earth as it is in heaven, God's will, which is so perfect and complete in heaven, is not in charge on earth. At least not in the same way now. So there's coming a day. The thrust of the verb is future. There is coming a day when the enemies of God, who have a strong hold on the world now, will not have that hold. Praise God, that won't last forever. There's a better day coming. We have something much better, much more righteous, much more joyful to which we can look forward. This isn't the way it's always going to be. This is not the way it's always going to be. On the authority of the Word of God from the mouth of our Savior, through the Holy Spirit who inspired Matthew to write it, this is not how it's always going to be. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The word is parakaleo. Does anybody know what that word, how that word is translated in other settings? Holy Spirit. Yeah, the one who comes alongside to comfort. It's used of the, the, the Holy Spirit is called the paraclete. And that's the word that's used here. The whole thought is in the future tense. And the word means exactly what the English translation conveys. Sometimes that's not the case. We have to sort of parse things in order to figure out exactly how what the word means because the translation is maybe very difficult, or maybe they didn't get it quite right. In this case, it's exact, right on. It, it, it comes across as comfort or consolation. Those who mourn today will be consoled and comforted in the future. One more quote from Morris. Actually, this is the, the, the rest of the first quote that I, I said to you. It is to such that Jesus holds out the prospect of ultimate consolation. Now they mourn, but now is not always. God's ultimate triumph, and with it the comforting of those who have grieved over evil, is sure. End quote. So, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Thoughts or questions? We're going to, got a couple more thoughts to go through here, but anything that comes to mind as you listen to that? Doc? Yeah. Microphone. Thank you. On my notes, it says that it refers back to Isaiah 61, and maybe you already said that. I did not, but but, you're, but some of the notes, it did say that. Go ahead. Um, very interesting, because you look at that, and then the discussion is, who is Isaiah writing about? Because it says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And then that refers back to a passage in Luke that Christ spoke those exact words. And what the author in this one was saying, he thinks it's the mourning of the believers who are sorry for their um, sins. Okay. And Christ or God is comforting them for that. So who is the one who will comfort us? The Holy Spirit. Yeah, Spirit of God. It's not and 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 in fact, who who is the one who came as our Jesus sent the comforter, but but where do we get our comfort? We are in who? We are in Christ. That's where our comfort's going to come from. That's where eventually where things will get set right because the Lord Jesus is going to sit on the throne. He will then be ruler over the world, not Satan. Good, Doc. Thank you.
Anyone else? John, up here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I think, <clears throat> I hope I can articulate this. There's, there's another message or another way of, an additional message here that is a little more subtle. Of course, the whole thing is pretty subtle. We're having trouble <laughs> defining and looking. That doesn't make sense, you know. But um, the, uh, he was apparently directing his remarks to his disciples, but I'm sure that they came out of the Old Testament mindset. Of the law, mm -hmm. and he goes on later in the chapter to say, "I'm not here to do away with the law. I'm here to fulfill it." So he's talking about their perspective, but they got some things wrong, and that uh, is epitomized, I think, in verse 21 when he says, "You have heard it said that you shall not commit murder," mm -hmm. but he says, uh, "You don't quite take that far enough. Even if you're angry at your brother." you're guilty. And then in 27, he says, uh, you have heard that you shall not commit adultery. But he said, goes on to say, however, if you, in the spirit of the law, if you even look at a woman to lust after her, you have committed adultery. So he's, he's giving them, opening their eyes to what they have missed. And you could say that about the Beatitudes too. Uh, the one we're on tonight, uh, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The, uh, if the Pharisees or Sanhedrin were listening, they would pick up on this. They didn't mourn very much. They kind of prided themselves uh, and probably looked down on the broken and brokenhearted. Um, and the example you mentioned in, in what Matthew 17 about Jesus mourned over the city of Jerusalem uh, and that's an excellent example, I think, of what that means. Um, but the Pharisees missed that. Uh, and I don't know what they knew about comfort, but if you look at the first one in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, they were, the Pharisees were not poor in spirit, as you alluded to or mentioned last week. Mm -hmm. They were proud in spirit. So uh, you could almost say, you have heard it said that blessed are those who are proud in spirit. But I say to you, no, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. And the, uh, the another clear example, some of these are difficult to look at that way. Um, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I think of the situation where the woman caught in adultery. Um, they didn't show mercy. They were going to hold them to that lady to the letter of the law. And so he says, no, you've heard that it's said, but I tell you, the merciful will find mercy. So I just, I think that's kind of interesting, adds a little dimension to what we're talking about. I think it does as well. Um, context is king, right? And uh, you move down just a few verses later from where we are, and that's what you find. Um, you guys have, have this in mind, and that's, it's true. I mean, murder is a bad thing, but... You're not getting the whole picture here. I, and I, I do think that, that uh, from the beginning, Jesus knew that his message would not resonate with the leaders of Israel. It's not to say that he wasn't making a legitimate offer of the kingdom, but from the beginning he knew. This is God, right? This is second person of the Trinity. So he knew what was going to happen. And um, you're right, they, they were not people who mourned what what they mourned was that there was a righteous person in their midst who might take their power away, or might make their power go away, and uh, that's what they mourned. They didn't mourn the fact that they were wicked. They didn't mourn the fact that they stole things from widows. They didn't mourn any of that stuff. They mourned that the fact that there was somebody in their midst who was pointing their sin out to them. Pastor Matthew, I like Bible studies and word studies, and when I look up the word mourn. I see other contexts, like in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 5, you have uh, immorality in the church, uh, verse 1. And then verse 2, it says, You are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he, uh, what he has done, this deed taking away from among you. 
uh, the, the severeness of a sin and how they should be grieved for it. Uh, also in James, um, with the submit to God, resist the devil context, um, verse 9, it turns to say in chapter 4 of James, lament and mourn and weep. All of the con- context is on the wickedness and on Satan who's um, trying to attack the righteous and this idea of mourning. And it goes alongside this word of mourning in, in, in the Beatitudes here. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting how it's not just here that it has this context. It's used several places. Right. Uh, once, uh, once again, coming back to the concept of context, the Scripture interpreting Scripture, um, it's the best interpreter of Scripture. And uh, so mourning does show up in other places, and, and it, it, it reiterates what we've been talking about. It's not that, that there weren't people who mourned the things we, we mentioned earlier that are typical in, when we think of mourning, but there is mourning over sin throughout Scripture. And one of the things that you see in Psalm 51 where David laments his sin is a mourning over the fact that he stepped into a situation in a sinful manner and a lot of people got hurt in the process. And he mourns his own sin. But he's also grateful for the fact that God is a forgiving God. I would I would even add this to like death. Like why is death here? It's mourning over sin and what results of the fall and the grief of not only the loss of the person, but the sin, the whole sin brings forth death. That should, that, I, I you don't always think of that way on that aspect. And on a mournful day with losing someone, you don't always think of the, oh, this is sin displayed in front of me. This is what, this is, I look forward to the day when sin is dealt with completely and, forever. And we never have to be separated from those that we love again, never again. Right now, it's the result. And, you know, sometimes people take exception. What, what are you saying? You're saying that my loved one was a sinner? Well, yes, because we all are, but that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is we live in a sinful world. We live in a world cursed by sin. And the curse of sin, the result of that curse is death. And that's why we suffer that stuff. Um, our missionary, Jim Garcinas, this morning was talking about serving in old age. And on a number of occasions, he said, I talk to people and I say, you need to prepare to die. You need to prepare to die. And people don't want to hear that because they're scared to death. And what's on the other side of it? And he said, uh, this afternoon we were talking with him, he mentioned that talking with Christians, sometimes people are afraid of death, but sometimes Christians are just like, oh, do you know? If they're right and I only have two weeks to live, I'm going to stand within the next two weeks. I'm going to stand in the presence of my Savior. You know how cool that is? Now, it's a different perspective. So, All right, let's uh, wrap this up. Um, we have two other thoughts here, the kingdom meaning and then uh, the contemporary impact. So the kingdom meaning is that the 1,000-year kingdom of Jesus Christ is the time when everything will be set right. Not before then. Right? Not everything is being set right now. We're not in the kingdom. It will be set right during the kingdom. And God's people will be comforted about the sin that isn't present then, but is so rampantly present today. That state of affairs has never happened yet, and there is no hint that it will happen anytime soon. What we see now does not give us hope that we humans will be able to solve the mess on our own. (laughs) We've been working at this for how many years? Let's let's solve this mess. How are we going to do it? Let's have another war. Let's beat those guys back. Are they wicked? Yep. Are we? Yep. We don't think we are, but we are. Situation is not getting better. It's getting worse. But God has issued numerous promises that he'll put things back right. Put them back in order. And that'll take place during the millennial kingdom. That's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 5 through 7. That's what he was offering with himself as king. <clears throat> and that's what's coming someday on the authority of the sure promises of God. I'll go back to this again. 
I think it's really important that we understand this. People who say that the promises of God have been transferred to somebody else are calling God a liar. I don't care how they sugarcoat that. They're calling God a liar because God said these promises are going to happen in this way. And if they don't happen in that way, then God has not kept His promises, nor does He plan to. That's not the God that I worship. The blessing of comfort with respect to sin and its horrible consequences will be ours when Jesus sits on His throne in Jerusalem and rules the world with righteousness and justice. That's what's coming, and that's why this is a future tense. Now, what difference does that make to, to us today? Does the increasingly wicked bent of the world we live in bother you? Does the increasingly wicked bent of the world that we live in today bother you? I like that answer. Yes, it should, because we worship a righteous God. And we have a relationship with the living God who is righteous. It should bother us that the world's becoming increasingly unrighteous. But it also is pointing toward the fact that Jesus is coming. And I'm going to have a relationship face to face with my Savior. As children of God, a world that is more and more in God's, in God's face should grieve us should not cause, cause us to crawl into a hole and hide. Jesus goes on in Matthew 5 to encourage His followers to be salt and light. That's coming up in verses 13 through 16. So in spite of the fact that we live in a, in a world that is filled with sin, we are still here as salt and light. To stand for truth, as Paul said in Philippians 2.15, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world is still our responsibility. We aren't of the world, but we are still in the world. And as ambassadors to earth, we still have a responsibility to represent our God in the society in which we live. But it should bother us when truth is stomped into the mud in favor of what is obviously false. It should bother us when sin is celebrated and God's instructions are ignored or mocked. And that's why we're going to put some things on our sign. So be aware that the sign is a public thing. We put some of those things out on our sign in June. We may have some people who don't like that and may respond negatively to that. We're not going to say you all are a bunch of horrible people. What we're going to say is we celebrate the one who is not. And here's the reasons. Because of his humility, because of his love, because of his salvation, because of his sacrifice. We should mourn now. But we also need to remember that this state of affairs is not going to last forever. And that we have a, a living, breathing relationship with the one person who will someday change all this. So even though sin seems to have the upper hand today, we can be comforted, even now, knowing that God will set His Son on the throne of David someday, and there will be righteousness and peace on earth. Alright, any other thoughts or questions?